Hello and welcome to the Knowing and Growing show. Today we have a real treat in store. As always we're going to be exploring other facets of reality and how we can know a little bit more about ourselves and about nature by allowing synchronicity to guide us, by forgiving, by exploring different ways of healing. Today I'm with Belinda Fowell and she's had a very interesting life's journey shall we say and I think as Belinda shares her story it will give us all some inspiration and some some hope for our own lives. Belinda perhaps you'd like to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about the story you're going to tell. Well aloha I'm Belinda Farrell I think today I'm Belinda Farrell. Who knows who we are? But <laughs> <laughs> um, I've had a very interesting life since, um, oh my gosh, all my years of being on this planet. Um, I started out at University of California at Berkeley. Um, you know, I wanted to be an actress for a while. And I, my first job out of college was being Snow White at Disneyland. So I ran around the park with seven little dwarves, and that was that was interesting because young children just love to believe in fairy tales, and I I've always just wanted to be happy and impart kind of happy things to people, and Snow White was a good beginning. I worked at ABC. I was a television news reporter for a while. Um, the CIA recruited me to go to Washington D.C. Um, I was going to be an agent in Spain. That didn't happen. And I ended up working for a senator in Washington, D.C., one that I respected very highly. His name was Charles Percy from Illinois. And I met my husband, my then husband there. And it was the year of 1968 when Martin Luther King was shot and John, uh, Robert F. Kennedy was shot. And it was, it was a horrible time to be in Washington. So we left, got married, went back to LA, and I got my teaching credential, and the Vietnam War was going on, and um, my husband owed the Navy some, some years, so we ended up in Puerto Rico um, to serve the Navy and the armed forces, and that's where I taught school for a while. So, you know, I came back home and had children, had, um, was more or less a, a normal life until I turned 40. And then the marriage broke up. And I began to see that I had a lot of fear inside of me and I needed to, to grow and I needed to expand. And I ended up being like a protege for Tony Robbins. I don't know if you've yeah, heard yes, of him. Indeed. Yes. And so I took a fire walk and it changed me. It was like a metaphor for what else you could do in your life. If you say to yourself, my gosh, I've walked on 2000 degrees of hot coals. What else would I like to do in my life? And by that time I had been doing quite a few fire walks. And what came up for me is that I wanted to drive a race car. <laughs> Didn't even know how to do a stick shift. But <laughs> But Tony teaches you a mantra that says, if I can't, if I say I can't, then I must. And if I must, I will. So there's no such thing as can't. And I thought, well, I can't drive a race car, but I, okay, I must. <laughs> so I called to find out where I could get some training to drive a race car. And we had a, a place that called Sears Point at the time up in Sonoma County. And I applied for the Grand Prix road racing course. It was a four day course. I was scared to death because I didn't even know how to drive a stick shift. So I, I got there and I was the only girl, of course. And there was the Porsche racing team from Canada that was present. But after the four days, I had a little bit of talent, so to speak. And so I got hired to drive cars in New York, up wow. in upper state New York. And it was amazing. It was like the beginning of my stunt driving career. And I did it for about eight years. They trained me more in spins and slides and 180s and 360s and terrorist driving. And it was just remarkable. Wow. I, uh, 
was one of the most, I guess, um, exciting, pleasurable times of my life. And it was just incredible. It was like the more you put yourself out there, the more you risked your life, um, the more exciting it was. I, I guess I was an adrenaline junkie. And then I collapsed with herniated discs towards the end of that and um, didn't have any insurance and so had to use what I was learning in Hawaii. I was still learning hypnosis and I was just like a sponge for finding out what makes people motivated to do what they do or motivated not to do it. So I, I was really investigating the unconscious mind and hypnosis is a great way of doing that. And then I came upon the ancient Hawaiian healing practices while I was in Hawaii. And that's what really started to make a difference in my life. And I used the, the Huna practices, the, the forgiveness process, to clean my own inner thoughts and my own memories to heal my back so that I wouldn't have surgery. And that was part of the reason for writing the book, was to show people that there is an alternative way that you can activate yourself if you're so motivated. You have to take an active role in your healing to do that. So I'm very grateful because I still use it to this day. I'm still very active. Um, and I don't like going to doctors, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> if I can do it myself in an invas you know, invasive, non-invasive way um, that's healthier, that's what I'd like to do because I know that the body has this innate intelligence and it can heal itself if we just give it the opportunity to do that. Absolutely and I, I'm smiling at m much of what you're saying because it just resonates so much with the sort of things that I say and do and and help hopefully help others to do. So let's go back to the, um, the, the HUNA. You said you used the healing to heal your back and yes. you also mentioned forgiveness in there, which again, I, I particularly like, and I often find that you know, to, to bring in something like forgiveness is often a very important part of a, of a healing process. So can you sort of talk us through what, what you did and, and how it worked and how it felt? Well, again, everything is a, like a computer inside of us. I, I learned the unconscious mind is is just this very faithful little computer, like a little two-year-old child, listening to everything the conscious mind says. So when you find out what you've been saying to yourself unconsciously, you can see how that has been running your body. And for me, um, I, I realized that my script, my inner script was that I couldn't support myself. And I had been raised by a family that was very fearful. They had been They'd gone through the depression. There was a lot of lack. And so unconsciously, you pick that up as a child. And I would say to myself, I, you know, I can't be supported. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm telling that to my unconscious mind, who is supporting my back, eventually it won't support me anymore. And that's what happened. I had to change my thoughts. And forgiveness is one way that the ancient Hawaiians would do this every day. They would gather together as a, as a family. And as the sun would go down, they would forgive themselves with their higher self. This is the higher wow. part of them that lives at the top of the head. And they would offer the forgiveness, just saying, I love you, I forgive you, thank you. And all of that would go down into the water and it would be like you were neutralizing the thought forms that were inside of you by just saying, you know, I'm sorry, I love you, I forgive you. You're, you're changing the perceptions of the movie screen that is in front of you. Because if you can't see it, it has to, you have to be able to originate it from inside to see it on the outside. Absolutely. And it would neutralize the projections you had of those memories from the past. And then divinity or the light would come in and resource you something else, a clean slate, so that you could begin again. And that's literally what I did with a lot of my memories. As they would come up, as I would do this ha breathing, which the formula is in the book, um, I would do it for about 10 minutes. And then these memories that were stuck in the body 
would resurface. And I mentioned one of those memories on page 100, 109. And it, it was crucial. I didn't know it was there, but it was like, whoa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was amazing because it, it denoted to me that I had not been wanted as a child in my birth that my, I had been thrown away, so to speak. And um, it's like this baby being tossed out into the abyss, you know, of just a lot of asteroids and meteorites. And this baby is there and it's dodging all of this um, ammunition, I guess you'd call it, from, from the universe. And then all of a sudden these hands pick you up and they put you in the safe hands of this figure that's standing above all of this chaos. And I just felt finally loved and cared for. And as that was interpreted, I asked my mother about my birth again. And finally she came clean about saying that I had been taken to three abortion clinics. And yeah, so it was a miracle that I was even here, but the fetus remembers everything. So you remember everything that's going on in your mother and your, in your environment around you. And so that was the beginning of realizing, okay, so my actual parents didn't want me, but I know that I'm here for a reason and that I'm here to discover what that reason is and that I'm very well loved by my guides, my angels, the source. And it proved to me that my life was valuable and once you have that feeling <clears throat> excuse me that that you are worthy to receive love it has to come from the deepest essence of your soul you can you can think it but if you don't feel it it's not going to happen and that made me feel it for the first time that my life had a deeper purpose and that i was loved and it it changed everything. Then the healing started to occur. I forgave myself. I did the process of the forgiveness, which is very outlined in the book. Um, again, of just seeing what you're forgiving down below you, offering the forgiveness to yourself by saying, I'm sorry, I love you. I forgive you. Thank you. And then I just shake my shoulders and then that part of me just floats away and you begin again. You really just begin again. And once you are in the present time, that's magic because in present time, you can create anything. There is no past. There is no future. It's where a little child is and you're happy and you're childlike and you, you're playful. And that's the key to living your life. And you have energy to create new things. And uh, <laughs> absolutely, I totally agree. And you, you've been using this uh, little forgiveness exercise, which I first came across two or three years ago now. And I must admit, I find it a very powerful thing to, to do. Uh, and I'm beginning to share it with other people now. For our, our listeners, could you just um, talk us through? So, say someone is listening or watching who feels that there's, they've got a, a block. Um, can you talk them through how to use this yes. exercise? Um, you know, anything that you're talking about over and over and over again, you create cords that wrap around you. They, they just wrap around your organs, your soul, and the body can't really function when it has so much encumbered uh, chaos. So you, you see what you are you know, convoluted in, and you just kind of place it behind you. It's like you're on a, on a precipice looking down below you at what you have created with your thoughts. So you could put your mother and father down there, make them very tiny though, very tiny. And you put your brothers and sisters or your ancestors, um, people with authority, uh, doctors, lawyers, um, even your teachers, friends, old relationships, anything that you're conflicted with. And you put them down below you, like on a stage. And then you just breathe down on them. And you just offer the forgiveness to yourself because it's a projection coming from you. You can't change what happened to you in the past. The only, it happened. 
The only thing that you can change is the way you're looking at it now in the present time. So it's a forgiveness process for yourself to forgive yourself and to move on instead of carrying this burden like a sack of potatoes with you everywhere you go. I mean, if you want that kind of life where you don't create anything new because you'd just rather live in the past, then great, that's your choice. Everything is a choice. But if you're tired of that, if you're wanting to release the burden, then you just place it down there, look at what you have created, and then decide, you know, I, I can, I don't need to manage this anymore, because that's really what you're doing. The conscious mind just manages what is that chaos. And you'd rather have divinity fill you up with some light. Then you start all over with a blank slate. So as you see all these people and things down here that you felt guilty or anger about, even putting yourself down below, an image of yourself, and then you just offer the forgiveness. I'm sorry. That's all. I love you. I love you. I love me. That's what you say through your higher self because all is forgiven anyway. The, the person you are really offering this forgiveness with is your ego. The ego is the one that made you feel guilty about whatever it is you, you did because the ego has no connection to a higher part of you. So you just offer the forgiveness. I love you. I forgive you. Thank you. And then just like shake your shoulders. And then I kind of take my hand and I just push it away so that all of that stuff that was on the bottom, the divinity takes all those painful memories and just takes them away. Everything that you associated with those people, places, and things. And then it replaces it with the divinity. And something magical happens because once you cut those cords, then the person feels that. And somebody that maybe you were um, in opposition to for years suddenly calls you and says, you know, I'm really sorry that I did that. This has gone on long enough. And, you know, let's, let's change that. So that's what happens. It, it just, it's just a miracle stuff that, that goes on when you do this forgiveness process with yourself. And it's ancient. This is ancient Hawaiian. It's called Ho'oponopono. Ho'o means to make. Pono means right. And you're making right two times. And Morna Simeona, she was the one that went all over the world teaching this. She died in, in like, I think, 1992. And I learned this from her. She came to our class and she was instrumental in teaching this and wanting to spread this around because when people are neutralized to the past and the anger and the fear, my gosh, you can imagine what a world we would have. No more wars, perhaps. Well, yeah, what can I say? Yeah, you, you've really summed up all these ideas so nicely. and. Uh, that exercise is just one part of, of many ways in which we can, can help to bring this about. So uh, you're using the, the Huna healing, and yeah. so the forgiveness is part of that. Uh, in, in what other ways have you been enabling your, your own healing? Well, again, just watching my thoughts, listening to them, making sure that I'm you know on point when I'm talking to myself, you, you have to be, it takes a full-time job to really be conscious. <laughs> and I do say a lot of the time, you know, I love you. I forgive you. If I start feeling anxiety um, during the day for any reason, we, we don't know we're triggered by so many different things. I will just constantly go into, you know, I love you. I forgive you. I'll do a chant. I'll do a Hawaiian chant. And that always seems to calm things down as well. And um, I love Can you love give us a sample? <laughs> Pardon? Can you give us a sample of, of a Hawaiian chant? Yeah, this, my favorite is, I, I call it, it's like, a, it's like carrying ammunition with you because it changes the way people feel on the other side, even if they're coming at you and they're dangerous. They'll turn around and walk away. Wow. So this one... And, and the, 
I have this on a CD and it's on an MP3. It's all the words are written in the book as well. It's the I know on a chant. I know Thank you. That was so powerful. It is a very powerful chant and it's, what can I say? It just puts you in a state. It, it seems to awaken the cells that are asleep that don't respond to English because English is just a very young language, but these are ancient tonal patterns. Yeah. So it's like, you know, I swim with dolphins now in Hawaii, take people to swim with them and we listen to their sonar. And the sonar changes your frequencies yeah. in the same way that these chants are frequencies. They're higher frequencies, so they take you from a low density to a higher frequency. And in that frequency, all there is is love. Indeed so. That's wonderful, Belinda. Uh, you, you've mentioned your book on a few occasions. Can you just tell us what it's called, who it's aimed at, what can people can hope to, to gain by by reading it well it's a little rebellious book i guess i <laughs> called find your friggin joy <laughs> and it's available on amazon and through my website um www.hunahealing h-u-n-a healing.com and it's meant for people who really don't you know that want to take an active part in their healing and so it was how i healed my back this is almost 25 years ago without doing surgery, I was told I was never going to walk again because I had such nerve damage. I've always had some weakness in my spine. I was born with scoliosis. I wore a brace for the first couple of years of my life. And I still have challenges to this day, but nothing that compared to 25 years ago. And thanks to the HUNA and, and cleaning, you know, the forgiveness process, and the higher self comes in and changes the DNA. You just, you're evoking a higher part of you to come in and heal you. And once you get your thought forms out of the way through this erasure process, dissolving them, doing this forgiveness process, then you have this clear slate, like a, like a pipe, a pipeline that's suddenly clear of debris to send your dreams or your desires up to the higher self, which brings it down and changes the DNA in your body. And that's literally what happened. I, after, after the memories that were blocking me got cleaned, then I started to see myself climbing trees again, or playing tennis or dancing, doing things that a strong back would do. And the little unconscious, which is, is just an emotional you know, child, it's just, it loves that emotion. And so you give it the emotion, oh, wow, let's dance again, love to climb trees again, love to run and play again. And so it gets excited about that, sends that desire up the non-obstructed pipeline to the higher self, and then the higher self drops it down inside of you. Absolutely, and, and I use the, uh, the metaphor of a, a clear channel um, quite a bit of the, the way I work. So. Again, very much with you on that. Just one yeah. final thing um, I'd like to bring up, which we mentioned when we were arranging this. We said something about timing and how things worked out for you through being in the right place at the right time or synchronicity. Would you like to say just a little bit about that? It, isn't it amazing? Um, it's an amazing phenomenon, synchronicity. When you let go and you don't try to control the situation, then the universe seems to pop in 
and give you exactly what you need, not what you want, <laughs> but exactly what you need at the time. And I had an instant something to happen. I was afraid of water. All my life, I was deathly afraid of water. Even when I was doing fire walking, I was too embarrassed to tell Tony that I was afraid of water, had a phobia to it, swimming pools, anything. Now I go to Hawaii to learn all of these interesting um, processes, and I'm surrounded by water and ocean. <laughs> and I suddenly started getting dreams of dolphins and whales coming into my dreams and teaching me how to swim. It was bizarre, and it was almost like when I was having a higher self-connection, it was all about dolphins and whales, and they were never on my radar, ever. And then they were, and it was as though they started to recruit me and said, you, you've got to come out and see us. And yet I was so afraid, but I finally got somebody to take me out there, out to meet them, and then they started coming to me and downloading information to me, and that was over 20 years ago. And now I swim with these amazing beings, and it's it just is like an elixir for your soul because they open you up to such unconditional love. And the thing that you're the most afraid of, you find that that's what you most are in love with. I mean, I look at the ocean now, and I see it, with a lot of respect, but where we swim, they're gentle days and it's warm and it's like returning back into the mother, into the womb. So the way you talk to yourself is, is really prime. You can change your thoughts. You can change your reality to anything. And that's what I had to do. I had to change my thoughts and just, again, you change your fears. The fears go away. They're just illusions you know, false evidence that appears real. And you just create a whole different reality for yourself, another dream. Did I answer your question? I'm not I, sure. I'm not sure you did, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so synchronicity. I, 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 well, one example of it, an example of a synchronicity. Oh, that's right. And I was, so I was going out into the ocean, learning how to swim. That's why I went on that segue. And I got out a little bit too far one day and I got in trouble. I was caught in a, what is it they call one of these little current waves that, you know, were pulling me out to sea instead of drawing me back into shore. And I started to panic. I was losing energy. I was not even swimming. I was just kind of flagellating. And all of a sudden I just saw this huge turtle, giant turtle come. I was calling for help. And this turtle appeared, and I could feel it. I was hearing it say, do what I do. And I stopped struggling, and I just started to move my arms like turtle does. And the synchronicity of that turtle being there, I mean, at that moment, we locked eyes, and the wisdom of that connection, <clears throat> he took me over, or she took me over the current, and placed me gently on these rocks. It was like a jut, jutting out of, um, you know, a little safety place, and then disappeared. And all I had to do was say, help. And that turtle was there. I don't know if it was an angel or whatever guy, but it saved my life. And I learned from that that any time you struggle, you're going to lose. Mm -hmm. And you just let go, and you ask for help, and help is there. And it was just, I, I do it in my everyday life. If something's happening and I'm trying to struggle, I just let go. And then the right thing seems to happen. You just don't struggle or you'll suffer. And I, I think, you know, letting go of control is something people have a hard time, <laughs> hard time with. <laughs> so I've, I've experienced but in that letting go, the synchronicity of what is to happen to you in a more divine way is welcomed to come in. And I think of the turtle all the time with that. I can imagine. That is a wonderful story. And as you say, so much of what you're saying is it's inspiring. It gives people hope and it helps us to, to let go, as you've said. Thank you let so go. much, Belinda. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank oh, you so exciting. Much. Thank you. Aloha.